Well, good afternoon. It is good to be with you, even if it is only virtual. Our passage today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. But to really understand what's going on in this passage, we need a little bit of the backstory. Now, as I've said before, the Old Testament, which is where we find our passage, is largely the story of God's interaction with a particular group of people, sometimes called the Israelites, sometimes referred to as the nation of Israel, sometimes referred to as the Jewish people, and sometimes referred to as the Hebrews. Uh, but it's largely the story of God's interaction with this group of people. Now, historically, uh, at the time uh, when 1 Samuel uh, is being written and recording the events of 1 Samuel, uh, historically speaking, uh, this is a time in Israel's history uh, prior to the monarchy. So this is before King Saul, before King David. Um, and under the monarchs, there was first a unified monarchy, uh, and then... Um, after Solomon, King Solomon, there became a split referred to as the divided monarchy. Well, this is long before uh, the monarchy happens, uh, in which case you have uh, the Israelite people um, having entered the promised land, uh, but they're not exactly one cohesive group of people. Um, there's lots of, of tribes of Israel and, and they're kind of operating on their own. Uh, very regional, uh, very tribal. And so this is the period known as the period of the judges. Now, judges, don't think of them necessarily as the way that we think of judges as um, presiding over a legal court. Uh, they would do that sometimes, but they also functioned as military generals or governors. Uh, judges were local leaders. Um, and Eli is a priest, um, and he is functioning as a judge. Uh, Eli, in our story, is essentially the second to last judge. Uh, Samuel is essentially the last judge before we encounter um, King Saul and then King David under a new period of history in Israel, the monarchy. Um, also, uh, it's kind of important to know where Samuel comes from and his backstory. So Eli, the priest, uh, is presiding in Shiloh uh, at this time. And a woman named Hannah comes to the temple and she's praying. Uh, she's not able to have children, uh, but she desperately wants a child. And so she prays and, and God blesses her. And Samuel is born. And to communicate her appreciation, her gratitude, and her love for God, she dedicates Samuel to the Lord. And so Samuel, from the time that he's very young, stays uh, and lives at the temple uh, in service to God. So in our story, uh, our passage begins by telling us that Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli in verse 1. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. The word of the Lord was rare. What's being communicated here is that this was a period of time in which there wasn't much spiritual clarity, um, spiritual focus, uh, an absence of spiritual leadership. And so this is kind of a, a dark time in uh, the history of Israel, um, a time in which there was a real searching and a real um, craving uh, for something more. And ultimately that, that leads to the monarchy, which presents its own challenges. Um, but here's a time when uh, civically uh, and spiritually there's a real void uh, in Israel. Uh, they don't. They don't often hear from God. I I imagine that we can identify with that. 
2020 was an awful year for most people. Um, COVID-19 uh, claimed around 300,000 American lives. Um, millions of Americans lost their jobs. And we saw divisiveness and division in the political world, perhaps unlike any we've ever seen. And about a week and a half ago, we saw a riot at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., in which uh, a federal police officer was killed and four protesters also died uh, as a result of uh, a group of protesters breaking into the Capitol to demonstrate and to, uh, to protest, to communicate their frustration uh, and uh, lack of faith in the political system, political structure in the election that had just taken place. Now, whether you're of the belief that uh, the results of the election are moving us towards a period of increased spiritual clarity and focus, um, or whether you're of the opinion that the election uh, is the results of the election are moving us away from a period of spiritual focus and clarity. I think the events of the protest at the Capitol pretty clearly demonstrate that as a country, we aren't where we need to be. We aren't at a place where there is a lot of spiritual clarity and spiritual focus. Now, I suppose that we can debate um, the intricacies of, of how and why we arrived at this place, but I don't think we've arrived here because God has drifted from us. I think perhaps both individually and corporately, perhaps we have demonstrated our tendency to drift from God. When I was a kid, I remember being on uh, a vacation with my family, and we would always uh, go to Galveston uh, almost every year or every couple of years we'd, we'd drive down to the coast. And uh, I remember one year in particular, and you know, I, was, I was just a kid, we were at the beach, and I, I went out into the water, and um, I think I maybe had some, uh, some uh, pool toys with me, and I was floating on one, and then I just kind of closed my eyes and um, floated there for a while. And when I looked up, opened my eyes, I was about a hundred feet offshore. Um, I, had, I had drifted out a little bit, unbeknownst to me. Uh, and not only had I drifted out, I had drifted down the beach some. So I you know, had to get up and swim back towards the shore until I could feel the sand under my feet and, and walk and push against the current to get back to the shore. It wasn't that the beach moved. It was that I drifted. I got caught up in the current and the waves and unbeknownst to me, I had drifted offshore. What that story reminds me of is that I don't think it's God who moves. I mean, the beach didn't move. I moved. Um, I allowed myself to let the waves and the current take me where they would. I think we have a tendency to do the same. We get caught up in the rhythm of life. Um, we get caught up in the the events of the day, our jobs, our home lives, various responsibilities, everything going on in the news, and perhaps we forget. We forget to be intentional in keeping ourselves moored to God with simple but intentional daily practices, reading scripture, praying, praying together, 
it's easy to drift away from God. And in our story, I think Eli and the country of Israel is experiencing something similar. Verse 2, it says, Now Eli, who was very old, excuse me, one night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. So Eli has been the spiritual leader for Israel, for this group of people, especially those near Shiloh. Um, but we would find out earlier in Samuel and, and a bit later in Samuel that Eli's sons, those who would uh, replace him as priest, um, have been up to no good. They have been essentially using their position of power uh, for their own benefit. And later on, we'll find out that Eli and his sons uh, are punished pretty severely for this. But Eli says that his eyes, uh, he's, he's barely even able to see. I think literally, of course, this is true of Eli's physical condition. But I think there's uh, a spiritual message here as well that the author is communicating that, that Eli's um, ability to, to see and hear God is waning. Um, and he's, he's sleeping in his usual place. It also says, verse 3, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Um, they would light this lamp during the night. It hadn't gone out yet, and so um, it's very uh, close to dawn, but not yet quite dawn. Um, Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. So physically, um, we're encountering some perhaps mundane details, that Eli struggles with sight, um, that it's almost dawn, and that Eli is sleeping, and excuse me, Samuel, is sleeping in the house of the Lord um, where the ark of God is. But again, I think there's, there's some spiritual connotation to what's going on, that Eli is reaching this point in his life, in his ministry, where he's not able to hear God or see God as clearly. Um, but we're coming to the end of this period. Uh, it's almost dawn. And dawn will re reveal a new, uh, a new hope. And I think that Samuel represents that hope. And, and the proximity of where Samuel is. It says Samuel is sleeping near where the ark of God was. Samuel is physically, and we'll learn spiritually, close to God. And then we have this exchange, verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Now this is interesting that Samuel hears something. He doesn't know that it's God. In fact, at first he thinks it's Eli. And so he runs to Eli. Now we could say um, if uh, the ark of God, which represented the presence of God, if Samuel was close to it, then maybe that's why he heard it. But I think the reason why Samuel heard it and that Eli didn't is that the, the author is communicating that, again, Eli... Uh, because he hasn't um, done everything in his ministry that, that God has asked him to do, that God has commanded him to do, that he's drifting away from God. That he's not able to see God clearly. His eyesight is almost gone. He's not able to hear God clearly. He's not the one who hears God call. Samuel, the boy, is the one who hears God's call. But Samuel doesn't know what it is yet, and so he runs to Eli. See, Samuel is able to hear God's call because he's spiritually moving towards God. His, his spirit is one of openness and, and helpfulness, whereas 
Eli has, has drifted away. And then we have, uh, we have the scene repeated, um, this where God calls Samuel. Samuel doesn't know um, that it's God calling, so he runs to Eli, and this happens two or three times. Um, Samuel doesn't know that it's God. And in verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And so the reason why Samuel doesn't know that it's God is his inexperience. Remember when you were trying to learn how to drive? You get behind the wheel. Um, there's some pedals down at your feet. Um, there's probably a, a clicker, uh, uh, some kind of shaft sticking out of the, the steering wheel to the side. Um, maybe a, a knob down here. Uh, maybe another shaft here. Um, and you don't necessarily immediately know what all of these things do. You don't necessarily know how to operate this machine much less the symbols that you're seeing when you are operating the machine. Different colored lights, red, green, yellow, some metal signs on the roadway. Some are shaped like this and yellow. Some are shaped like this and red. Diamonds, octagons, some circles with X's through them. It's a whole other language. And your inexperience and your ignorance means that initially you didn't know how to do all of those things. You had to learn it. And what's more, you had to have somebody teach it to you. And you also had to learn stuff on your own just through observation. But somebody or, or something had to explain to you how to navigate these signs, how to navigate all of these buttons and knobs and pedals. Samuel is inexperienced. He hasn't yet encountered God, and he needs somebody to teach it to him. He needs community, someone outside of himself to help him navigate what he's encountering. You know, community is a incredible thing. You know, Samuel needed community from Eli. He needed the help of someone outside of him. And when we engage in community, some incredible things can happen. I was doing some reading and I learned that uh, Steve Jobs, um, the famous um, creator and leader of Apple, um, the uh, maker of my phone, maybe your phone, computers, this, this tech giant, uh, which has come to define some of the ways in which we engage with one another via technology. Um, at one point, he was uh, crossways with some of the leadership in Apple. And in 1986, uh, he left Apple uh, and he purchased uh, what we understand today as Pixar. Uh, it was a company that uh, dealt with computers and he bought it for about $10 million. Um, and they were moving into a, a new space, a new building and Steve Jobs uh, looked at the plans for this building, and there was plans for three separate buildings. One where the computer science employees would work, one where the animators would work, and then one for the um, administration, the leaders, the executive staff. And Steve Jobs looked at it, and he scrapped that plan, and instead replaced it with one large building and at the center of that building he placed things 
that would draw people, a cafeteria, mailboxes, a coffee shop, a gift shop. And as a result, the people would, would congregate in those areas. They would discuss with each other. They would um, share their ideas with one another. And there's a, a degree of, of cross-pollination and connectivity and creativity and innovation that that company hadn't experienced before. Now we know that Pixar um, became very successful uh, and is still successful today. Uh, Steve Jobs bought the company that became Pixar uh, for $10 million. And when he left in the early 2000s, um, he sold it for $7.4 billion. Now, I think the, the money figures uh, only go to show um, the incredible growth and incredible creativity and energy and excitement that came from the community that he fostered um, that became uh, the empire known as Pixar. And I share that story because I think it helps us remember that community, in community, we can do some incredible things. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Community is essential. In our passage, Eli and Samuel needed community. Eli needed a community to be able to, to move back towards God because he himself um, had drifted from God. And Samuel needed Eli to, to teach him the way. He needed community with Eli so that he could position himself to be able to hear God and to follow what God was asking him to do. We need community. When Jesus called disciples, he didn't call one, he called 12 apostles and many more disciples that traveled with him and learned from him and shared in life together. Discipleship was never meant to be a solo activity. We need community. And I know that this past year, community has been harder than ever. The pandemic has made it more challenging for us to spend time together or to spend any length of time together. But even though it's made community harder, it hasn't made it impossible. My encouragement for you today, as we try and figure out how to intentionally move back to God as a community, as individuals. You know, when I found myself um, out in the surf, I had to stand up, I had to swim hard, and I had to, to get up and, and push my way against the current that had taken me out and down the beach. I had to get back to my family, and so I had to work towards that. It required intentionality, focus, clarity. We can encounter that together in community. So I would encourage you, pick up the phone and call someone who's having a hard time or, or call someone who encourages you. Write a letter, send a text, send an email. Anything that allows you to connect with someone who can encourage you, who can pray with you. I'm happy to do that. You can email me, you can call me. I'm here to serve, but I also am here to live life with you in community. When we participate in community, incredible things can happen. And I'm hopeful for a new year. Amen.